what we're actively trying to do is build the foundation between now and our 150th so that we've got the university founda the foundation laid for the university so that the university is ready to address the educational needs of the students of Iowa and the people of Iowa for the 50 years that follow. To do that, we need to take care of this university and we need to think out and look forward and say, what do we need to be doing 50 years from now? What's higher ed going to look like? What's our state's economy going to look like? What are our students going to look like? None of them have been born yet. The parents of them haven't been born yet. But we need to look out and lay that foundation so that we've got a university that is still vital when we reach our 175th anniversary, our 200th anniversary. So I want to look a little bit at some of the challenges that we face and some of the things that we need to be working on. This past year has been a fairly successful year for funding the university. We requested $4 million in additional money from the state for our general fund to move our general fund from $96 million to, 90, yeah, $96 million to $99 million, just right at $100 million. We received that funding from the state. It allowed us to hold our tuition constant for this next year. And if you meet a student on campus and they don't say something to you about it being held constant, how good that makes them feel, you've got to be kind of fortunate because they're all talking to us about how great a deal it is to have their tuition held constant while all of their friends across the state are seeing tuition increases. We need to do this to be more competitive and we'll look at that in just a little bit. We have several things that we ask for special purpose funding. Most of these are in economic development. All of that was held pretty constant except for one item. The STEM initiative, the governor's STEM initiative received an extra million dollars. It went from uh, a little over five million to a little over six million dollars in funding, especially for outreach in taking some of the, the pilot programs that had been created and extending those to a broader reach across this state in K to 12, uh, school districts to improve science, math, engineering, and technology education. In economic development, we received what we asked for, um, and we got a grant this year um, for of $1.5 million for advanced manufacturing our metal casting center from the Iowa Economic Development Authority, which really will boost what we can do to support Iowa's manufacturing industry here in the state. We also received an extra $400,000 to support uh, the advanced manufacturing, the additive manufacturing center inside the um, metal casting center that is over at TechWorks. We'd asked for the $400,000 and, and it was really nice to see it first put in the governor's budget but then approved by the legislature as well. The one area that we didn't receive the funding that we were asking for is the renovation of the Industrial Technology Center. And that center, uh, we did get a million dollars put into the budget, not for this year, but for next year for planning. It really is an indication that they're serious about making this happen. They just didn't have the money to do it this year. It will be a major push for us this coming year to get that fully funded um, and to get the now nearly $40 million we'll need to construct and renovate uh, the rest of that uh, structure. Fundraising was a remarkable year. Uh, kudos to our advancement staff. Um, this year we raised $28.5 million. That's $5.5 million, uh, five and a half million, if you can see, $5.7 million more than last year. That's a, uh, about a 25% increase from the year before and a 50% increase from the year before that. We're running, uh, that number's about $6,000, uh, excuse me, about $6 million above the previous five-year average. There is one year that we brought in more money than that, but only by a little bit, about $31 million. Uh, so we're really continuing to climb and grow our private philanthropy. So for all of our colleagues in advancement, thank you very much. Much of this goes to uh, scholarships and to help our faculty and staff in projects that are going on across this campus. Congratulations. Uh, the first item that was up here is that we gained an extra $4 million in state funding, state appropriation dollars so that we could hold our tuition flat. A year ago, I told you a little bit about why we were going to ask for that, and I want to give you just a little update. A lot of this is based on looking at our peers and saying, what's their tuition relative to their research one institutions? This is the first state that I've worked in where the tuition at the regional comprehensive, you and I, is equal to that of the research one institutions in the state, in our case, Iowa and Iowa State. 
essentially our, our tuition is the same. If you looked at this slide a year ago, the difference between our tuition and the average of Iowa and Iowa State was only $114, $140. Essentially non-existent. But when you look at the gap between other peer institutions and their research institutions, it was about $2,500. This is the updated data. So if you look at the Uni University of Massachusetts Dartmouth, and you take their tuition, and you subtract that of UMass Amherst, what you find is that their tuition is $2,000 below that of UMass Amherst, so on and so forth. Even with us holding our tuition flat, and Iowa and Iowa State going up, we're now $515 below their average. We have a little ways to go, about $2,000 left to go. So again, we're going to be asking for additional money from the state so that we can hold our tuition as close to flat as possible. And again, get some separation and become more competitive in our tuition and fees relative to our major competition. This is an extremely competitive market right now. We'll look at that in just a little bit when we look at our enrollments. It's very important that we have our price point right. Getting separation from Iowa and Iowa State is an important part of that. Getting our tuition more in line with competitors in other states is also important, and that's what we're working to do. I know that all of you have heard about the enrollment challenges that we face, and we're going to look at those numbers in just a little bit. It's going to take all of us working on this. We're going to have to be very serious about directing our attention and our focus towards our enrollment and recruiting new students. Let me talk about some of the challenges we're facing. First of all, this is just a slide of our enrollment history, where our enrollment has been really since 1967. And what I really want to point out is what's happened since 2010. That's when we hit this peak of 13,168. Since then, we have been going down really every year. There was one year we were up by two students, two, in headcount. Okay. So we really have been going down the whole time. And we're going to be down more this year. We'll know more about exactly what that number is when we get to our census date in early, about mid-September. We have a challenge facing us that isn't unique to us. As we look at the data throughout the state of Iowa from 2010 to 2017, the dates at which we know what other institutions in the state had for enrollments, over that period of time, higher education enrollments in the state dropped 57,542 students, or 18%, between 2010 and 2017. Over that same period, we dropped by 10%. Community colleges dropped by 18%. Private colleges, for, not for profit private colleges, dropped by 6%. And the for profit, prof, for profit privates <laughs> dropped by 55%. It's not something that is just a challenge to us, it's a challenge to higher education, caused in part by the demographics, we'll look at in a little bit caused in part by this really hot economy. As the economy gets hot and unemployment rates go below, go below especially 3%, but even 3.5%, enrollments at community colleges, some of the small privates, and the regional comprehensives will follow that number, will follow that percentage down. We have seen that. There are some things, though, that we can do to work against that. What we've got to do is recognize that this is not an insoluble problem. It's a great opportunity. Everybody's facing that. Everybody has to work on it. What can we do to distinguish ourselves and bring our enrollment up? It will take us time. We won't solve this problem in a year because of what's happening with the demographics. But we need to get ahead of it and start to lay the groundwork so that we can come back stronger and faster and deal with it quickly. So here's part of the problem. This is the number of students that are graduating from Iowa's high schools in the past and on into the future. As you can see, 2018 is the last purple line. 2019, the 2018 at 34,570, 
Notice the number of high school students that graduated from Iowa's public high schools that year. These projections suggest that over the next really six to seven years, 2025, we'll see about a 7% increase in the number of students coming out of Iowa high school. Well, that's good, but it's not good enough to bring our enrollment up to 13,000 or 13,005, which it, we really need it to be with the size of the campus we have. We need to increase our market share. We need to do a better job of recruiting students. The other problem that's in here that we talked about last year is in the demographics. Our student, our, the students that are graduating from high school are becoming much, much more diverse. Currently, the, no, the percentage of students graduating from Iowa high schools that are from a diverse background stands at 16%. By 2032, it's 22%, and it continues to climb. The numbers are likely to cross somewhere around 2055. If you do the linear extrapolation, it's out in 2080. There isn't anybody be that believes it's actually linear. It's going to happen faster than that. Nathan Gruy up at uh, uh, Carleton College an economist has looked at this and, and he's predicting that there will be a big drop off in enrollments at universities and colleges. And what he's put into his economic model is the fact that, especially in Illinois, there's a large drop off in the number of students that are going to graduate from Illinois high schools. It's going to go from 130,000 to 116,000 between now and 2035. In addition to that, more and more students throughout the Midwest are going to be students of color and historically, they don't go to college at the same rates. So not only do you have fewer students, many of them, a larger percentage of them, aren't the students that typically go to college. His book really paints a doom and gloom picture. And it's easy to look at it and say, higher ed's in for a rocky start, a rocky future. That may well be. But there's an opportunity in that, and he's painted it for us. He just didn't tell us that it was an opportunity. And that is that these students from diverse and underserved backgrounds don't go to college at the same rate. We need to ask ourselves the question, why? And what can we do about it? How can we change that? That's part of the reason we've put in place a Panther Promise program. Part of the reason we put in place people in our admissions office that are going to reach out and bring more, try to develop an affinity with students of color. It's why we're active in things like an African-American reading program, family and children's reading program. It's why we're actively building programs in UNICU, the Center for Urban Education, that engages students from deserve, diverse and underserved populations in their education and help them understand that higher education is a possibility for them and graduating from a university is absolutely something that would be important in their life. It is an opportunity for us. The doom and gloom is there, and you'll hear lots of editorials about what's going to happen in higher education, and it will happen unless we think about how we serve that group of students in particular who traditionally haven't gone on to college. I want to emphasize that traditionally. We have to change that. We are in a position to work on that and affect that change. Can we do it fast enough? We'll see. There is urgency here. As we looked at enrollments a year ago and realized that we were going to be down last year and, and this year, we put together a set of enrollment principles and goals that you see up here. And the first of those is ensure quality. We could have 13,000 students on this campus this fall if we simply admitted everybody that applied and then actively recruited them. We don't do that. Because we know that there are two things that more than anything else control the quality of the education that students receive. One of those is the faculty and the staff that support them, and the quality of the students we bring. If we back up and let everybody in, we will follow the path of Parsons College and Iowa College that went under in the 1960s by basically opening it up and saying everybody has a right to at least try even if they don't have the skills and the knowledge and the ability to succeed, we should at least let them try. And they failed. And they closed about four years after that because they opened it up and became known as not a very good college. In fact, there's a Times article about them. We don't want to go down that path. We know that one of the things that supports the educational experience of our students more than anything else 
are the other students and the things that they bring to the classroom. So we will not back up on the quality of the students we bring in, and we won't back up on the quality of the faculty and the staff that we recruit. We are going to maintain our commitment to Iowa. We are the institution that educates Iowans for Iowa. 90% of our students come from Iowa, and that will not change. 85% of our students take their first job in the state of Iowa. We're going to continue that commitment by trying to develop a greater market share of those students who graduate from Iowa's high schools. We're also going to recruit heavily in our community colleges. We've been doing that over this past year reaching out to community colleges, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. We also um, are going to grow our non-resident enrollment. Now, a lot of people, when I mention this, think it's about the dollars, because in most universities, the amount that non-residents pay more than, much, much more than covers the cost of education. But what I know is that the state of Iowa is facing a major economic challenge. Right now, the biggest challenge facing Iowa is that 20 per, there are 20,000 more job openings in this state than there are unemployed people. 20,000 more job openings than unemployed people. There's a few things that can result for that, from that. The jobs can go out of state, and that's really bad. We could get more people who are currently not in the job market but live in Iowa into the job market. That's really hard to do. The other is we can bring people in. We actually are a solution to this problem, part of the solution. Because 50% of the students that graduate from UNI that came here from out of state take their first job in the state of Iowa. The legislature recognizes that and has asked us to recruit students from out of state. This next year, we'll actually be offering grants to students from out of state so that we can, their tuition and fees, their cost will be essentially equal to our cost to educate. We should be able to help recruit students from especially neighboring states in Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Illinois with that. So that's also an important part of what we want to do. So here's our real response. What have we done? And I'll talk about a few of these, and we'll, I've got a slides on a couple of the others. We've been working on future visioning and branding. I'll talk about that in a little bit. The Center for Urban Education has been very helpful in creating the Panther Promise Program and also in helping us enhance our minority student recruitment efforts. The Panther Pro Promise Program reaches out to a handful of schools around the state that have relatively large minority populations, especially popula minority populations who have traditionally not gone on to college. We work with their guidance counselors to uh, locate those students who have the skills and the academic record to be successful at a university and bring them to campus. Let them see our campus. Put support structures around them. Get them to apply while they're here. Get their applications in. We've already seen an uptick in our applications because of this program, not for this fall, but for next fall already. We're working with sophomores and juniors and seniors with this program. Uh, the Community College Outreach Program is one where, over the last two years, the, the transfer um, committee has been working, studying why students come to us, why students don't come to us from Iowa's community colleges. They've put together a set of six to seven different recommendations, from having four-year um, degree paths put together, to articulation agreements, what those need to be like, the increasing the interactions between our faculty and faculty at the community colleges. Kristen Woods and Kristen Mosher were uh, essential in pulling together the data and analyzing that data and working with the committee to come up with these recommendations. Kristen Woods and Patrick Pease have been charged by the provost to implement those as quickly as possible. We're already seeing increases in applications from community colleges. It's essential that we improve this pipeline. If you remember, the enrollments at the community colleges are going down. We can help them build their enrollments if the pipeline looks clear. But we need to have a bigger and bigger market share if their enrollments are going to continue to go down. We need to have a larger fraction of the students that are coming through the community college system coming to the University of Northern Iowa. Their presidents, their faculty and staff would like to have their students come to us because we offer a similar type of education, an education where they get to know their professors, 
an education where they're going to get to know their advisors. They're going to get to know the support staff. They might even get to know the president and the provost. That doesn't happen on much larger campuses. So we want to become, and many of the people at the community colleges want us to become, a, position, a destination of choice for community college students and graduates. We'll talk a little bit more about the constituent relationship management software uh, and, and integrated marketing communications. We have enhanced our out-of-state efforts uh, a great deal, reaching out especially to Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Illinois because they're close and most of our students come from that area. There's a large number of students, especially in Wisconsin and Minnesota, excuse me, Wisconsin and, and Illinois. Somewhat smaller but still significant population in Minnesota. If you draw a 200-mile circle around you and I, there are more people living in Minnesota inside that circle than there are people in Iowa. Now let that sink in for a little bit. Right? They've got some really good schools, and they've got some really good prices, so we've got to be pretty aggressive, and we've got to have our marketing right, and we've got to be really lined up and in tune to go after that market. But Minnesota is one state whose high school graduate, number of high school graduates is growing. So let's look at future visioning and branding a little bit. We've had two things going on kind of at the same time, future visioning. A look at what our university needs to be like 50 years from now. I think Randy will say 35, that's what I told him, but <laughs> 35 years from now. Um, but out at about 2050. And they've, they spent a lot of time talking with people on campus, running surveys, doing some focus groups, both on campus and off. And they've come up with a set of, of six different categories and a new purpose statement. We've handed all of that, that information to the people that are going to work on branding, Michael Patrick Partners. And they're going to roll that in with the information that they got from our branding group. The branding group was um, headed up by people in university relations and worked closely with the Center for Social and Behavioral Research on campus with uh, Mary Loke and Christy Rinka. They have been doing the same sort of thing, but now again around branding. What's the brand of you and I? What do people think of when you say you and I? And they have, again, been out doing surveys, they've been out doing focus groups, they've been talking to all kinds of people, different groups, student groups, faculty, staff, community members, students of color, students from different backgrounds, community members from different backgrounds, and pulling that all together. And now it's time to actually create that brand and the way that we actually push that brand out. Who are we? What do we want the world to know about us? And it's essential that that's a unified approach to branding and to marketing. One of the problems that we have right now is that we've lost the unity in our university in terms of marketing and branding. We have multiple messages with multiple fonts, multiple logos. And it's not clear that this is a unit versus We're a collection of different voices and different things. And while diversity is good in many respects, it means that people don't have a common understanding of what the University of Northern Iowa is about and does and what sets us apart because it looks like we're trying to do all things for everybody. So through this branding work and this marketing group work, we're going to bring together and provide a single front. We'll still have people working in the colleges, in athletics, in continuing ed, in various places. But we need to have those coordinated. We need a unified voice built around a common brand and a common marketing message. We're working with Michael Patrick Partners on that brand and that brand infrastructure. We also need to work on our website. A website really needs, when we first set one up, and most universities were this way, they were really for employees because the people interacting with the website for the most part were us. It had great stories about things that were going on. We knew exactly how to get in and find our directory and locate people and items on the web. But more and more, our prospective students are using the web to find out about us. And they're not using laptops. Oh, I took my cell phone out of my pocket. No wonder it feels weird. Um, they're using cellular devices, cell phones. They're using other mobile devices, iPads. They're not using laptops. 
we need to optimize our website for mobile devices. And we need to first and foremost realize, we need to realize that first and foremost, it's a re it is the recruitment tool. It's where students go, prospective students go to learn about you and I. As employees, we can always put something in our bookmarks for those places that we need to go. New students never will. Prospective students never will. They want to find information quickly. They want it at their fingertips. And they want it to look good on their mobile device. We're using Noble as a company to help us make that transition to a student-centered and student-focused website that is first and foremost compatible with mobile devices. Because that's how students are looking. And it's not about a new app. It's about how our website looks when you do a Google search for best colleges in the Midwest. And you and I shows up at the top of that list. And they click on it, what are they going to see? Are they going to have to wade through a bunch of things that are about things going on on campus? Or is the first thing they're going to see, welcome to the University of Northern Iowa. This is what you need to know if you want to be a student. That's going to be an important part for recruiting. We have changed some marketing things and put some new things in place. You'll start to see them. My wife and I were driving back from Wisconsin just yesterday. We were celebrating grandson's birthdays. We're driving down Highway 20, coming back into town. And there's always been a billboard there. A couple of years ago when we first got here, it had something about the right fit. This past year, it's had Panther Country and our, our big Panther Head Loco. It's great. We drove by there last night, and what did we see? We saw this bottom line. Passion belongs here, University of Northern Iowa more about all of our university. These are um, drawings of a new billboard campaign that isn't just here in the Cedar Valley and in a few places in Des Moines, but is being stretched across our state. We need to recruit in Dubuque and in Davenport, in Sioux City and Council Bluffs, Fort Dodge and Des Moines. Des Moines is by far our biggest market. We need to be there. But we need to present more about who we really are and what excites today's students. So we've put together a new ad campaign, not just these billboards, but also some uh, uh, live TV commercials. And you'll see new things coming out in print as well. The CRM, our constituent resource management system, is uh, now called Connect You and I. And it's the way that we hope to, con to communicate and connect with all of our students, but especially prospective students. When we first initiated this and opened it, and it went live last summer, we focused on getting information out to prospective students, especially seniors, and then students who were not yet seniors. We started to open that up and get the journeys focused not just on high school seniors, but high school juniors, and a different one for high school sophomores, and then below that. We're also working right now on uh, communications that will come from student support services. This will, when it's fully developed, guide communication to all of our students, prospective students and on-campus students, all. One of the real utilities is it'll allow us to track our communications with those students, not only who we've communicated with or when we've communicated with, but what we've sent them, what we've told them, what they know about, and be able to tailor new messages as they interact with us. And campuses that have implemented a constituent relationship, a CRM, constituent relationship management system, they've seen their admissions profile grow. They've seen the number of applications grow. They've seen their enrollment grow. But only if they take it very seriously and are sending out a constant stream of messages that are well-regulated and on point and not a diverse background of messages that are showing different things and different voices and different logos. It's important that the stream be pretty clean and unified. And that's what we're working on. And you can see some of the materials that we've already developed. These will change as we get information back from our branding, branding um, consultant and our marketing consultant. That will help us focus these even further. The other thing that we've done that we haven't talked about is you may have noticed that the little brown building right out here, kind of kitty corner from uh, Gilcrest and just to the east of the Curris building has fence around it. 
we're creating inside there a new admission center. And you can see some of the drawings of what we're trying to do in there, and it should be finished here this fall. Um, but create a, a welcome space and create a theater space where we can talk to them uh, as groups come in. Right now, we don't have a great space to do that. There's a small room that isn't really a theater. It isn't even hardly a classroom in Gilchrist. This will be a space that is dedicated to the admissions function, recruiting those students and helping them see what it's like to be a student at the University of Northern Iowa and up the ante a little bit. Okay. Uh, if you get a chance to really see these diagrams of the spaces, I know you're sitting a long ways away, but the diagram in the upper uh, right-hand corner uh, is sort of the welcome area, kind of relaxing. It looks a little like our library does and, and uh, Schindler. The uh, lower, the lower left-hand is, is the theater section where we'll actually be able to do videos and, and get them together for a chat and things of that sort. It'll also give them great access to the interior campus. From here, you can walk right to the Campanile. One of the windows will give a great view of uh, the Alumni Plaza and the Campanile. Really easy to connect to the library, to connect to Kakuras, to connect to other buildings around our campus.